Well, today's topic is God Gives Great Gifts. This uh, message will be on YouTube, so I don't know when people will be watching it, probably not in the Christmas season. But for us here in this room, it's the Christmas season. Maybe some of you have already got all of the gifts that you're planning to give. Maybe you haven't started. Uh, maybe you're wondering if someone has given you the gifts that you want and maybe you already know because you purchased them yourself and you've wrapped them and put them under the tree. Uh, while gift giving is on our mind, I thought it would be appropriate for us to remember how amazing God is in the gifts that God gives us. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to start in Genesis 15. God says to Abraham that I'm going to bless you many times. This is one of the times. God says, do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So God comes to Abraham and gives him really good news. He's going to have a great reward. But Abraham responds, it doesn't matter that much to me. Abraham has been blessed. He's got lots of uh, wealth com compared to other people in his region. Um, he's prosperous, but he doesn't have any kids. And he's unhappy that um, when he dies, whatever he has will be passed on to someone who's not of his own uh, family, not a, not a son, not a daughter. And so he says this to God. He says, O oh Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? In other words, it doesn't matter how much you give me because I don't have anyone to pass it on to. Um, and, a, and someone who's not related to me is going to get any wealth that I accumulate. God uh, tells Abraham, look toward heaven and count the stars. That's how many descendants you'll have. Uh, for a city full of light pollution, this doesn't mean very much. Uh, but there are a few places left in the United States where you can actually go out and see the stars. Uh, in some cases, in the, some deserts are far enough away from city lights. There's an island in uh, the middle of one of the Great Lakes that is so far from the city that you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye. Um, and when you have that kind of vision of the night sky, which is what Abraham and Sarah had, it's stunning. Uh, it's not just, oh, I can count those dozen or so stars. Th there's more stars than you can count. And another uh, way, that, another metaphor that God used that we maybe can relate to more than the stars uh, is that the sand if you count all the sand, that's how many descendants you'll have. Well, if you go down uh, in your spare time this week, after you're done Christmas shopping, and get a bucket of st sand and start counting, and then multiply that by the beach, uh, it's probably going to tax your math ability, and probably your patience in counting the sand, uh, and you'll quickly realize it's an impossibly large number, immense. And that's also true for the stars. If you know anything about uh, astronomy and know that some of those points of light that you see is not a, actually a star, it's a galaxy, or it's a, it's a huge system with many, many stars, uh, this is an incredible promise. And Abraham, at the time, doesn't have any descendants. So I wanted to start with this because it highlights what kind of a God we serve that God looks at our sources of pain and discomfort and lack, the, the areas where we think this part of my life is completely broken. Nothing is working out here. There isn't anything here. The places that we think are completely void. God looks at those and says, I'm going to bless that with abundance. You don't have to worry about that. God in gift giving is extraordinarily gracious and often gives into our pain far more than we can count. More than there are stars, more than there's sand. So God gives great gifts. Uh, James 1 says every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is coming from above, coming down from the Father of light. So all the good things that you receive were inspired by God that it, no matter what their source, no matter how it appears that they're coming, God inspired it all. And God, in God, there's no variation or shadow due to change. So you don't have to worry about, well, is next season going to be different? No, it's the same God 
who's not changing, just inspiring good, inspiring good, and inspiring good to come your way. So God's generosity, I've created a short list, and this is an extraordinarily short list. I'm sure you'll be able to add to it. But some of the ways that God is generous to us, one is with the gift of life. And as we're going through this list, one of the things that you'll discover is that everything we talk about, some people will think, oh yeah, that's not so great. At, at this spot in their life, some people are thinking, well, I don't value life very much. So not everybody is able to see in the moment the greatness of the gift. And maybe you've had that happen some Christmas Eve or Christmas Day in your house, where someone gets a present, awesome, you thought, but they didn't think a lawnmower was especially great or whatever it is. I received a bicycle as a youth and I wanted a bicycle, but this was, you know, as, as big as a horse, which if you haven't seen a horse up close, that may not sound like much, but sometimes we receive gifts and we don't realize how good they are and we have to grow into them. We have to come to an understanding of how great the gift is. Now you may be valuing life quite, a, quite highly, but whether you value it or not, the gift of life is tremendous gift. That you have a chance to be in this world, which includes deserts, oceans, mountains, more ecosystems than you probably are conscious of on a regular basis. So a tremendous diversity that is nearly impossible to fathom and a tremendous abundance. If you look at how things reproduce, if you just go to our garden right outside the door and take a look at one flower, how many seeds does it produce? It's only one, so it only needs one seed to create another thing like it. But does it just produce one seed? No, it produces dozens, hundreds, probably thousands, many of those flowers out there. Tremendous abundance. God's generosity, life and freedom. Freedom to choose something awesome or something not. Uh, gifts of the Spirit. Many of you know the fruit of the Spirit, the, the fruit that comes from being filled with God's Spirit is uh, amazing. Love and joy, peace, those, those are all attributes that come as you are filled with God's Spirit and act in accordance with God's will for you, that as God is filling you constantly, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The gifts of the Spirit are things that supplement the gift, gifts and talent that you have, that allow you to do the things that God has called you to do that are far beyond your imagining. So uh, for some people it'll be the gift of being able to see what others can't see, the blessing that people have, the gift of prophecy. Some people will be able to um, have the gift of healing. You have at least one gift that is intended to help other people in this assembly and around the world. It's a way that God blesses the world through you. Um, God's presence. Not only can you go into God's presence, so you can go in, into the throne room of God. You can pray to God and know that your prayers are heard. This is not the case with every system. But God values you, wants to hear from you. You can talk to God at any time. But not only that, God will come and be in you. You can have God's presence in you, the Holy Spirit in you, Jesus in you. So a tremendous gift of, of presence for us. Jesus, the Bible says, is the visible likeness of the invisible God. Jesus, therefore, would show us what God is like, model what God is like. So we can expect Jesus to be generous because God is generous and that's the case. So Jesus, the Bible said, left heaven. Jesus didn't just show up a baby. Jesus was in heaven with God, enjoying that presence, and decided, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be difficult. But for the sake of the people who will be reconciled with God, I'm going to go through that suffering. 
Hebrews says, for the sake of the joy that was before him, Jesus endured the pain of the cross. So Jesus left heaven, taught us how to live. Um, tremendously valuable because most of us have very small scale ambitions compared to what God knows is possible and what J Jesus demonstrated is possible. Jesus expected all of his followers to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, to um, announce the good news that the heaven is near, that heaven is near, and to uh, cleanse the lepers. And thought that that was just normal. That was just normal for followers of Jesus. So Jesus taught us how to live, and then Jesus died on the cross taking the punishment for our sin and allowing us to be back in right relationship with God. That's why the baby came. The baby didn't come with no purpose. Jesus came for this purpose. So God's generosity is reflected in that, in, in what Jesus did, allows us forgiveness. The things that, all the things that you're ashamed of, forgiven. All the things that you may do wrong in the, in the future, forgiven. Jesus and God provide for us salvation, the ability to reconcile with God who loves us, and eternal life, the ability to always be with God who loves us. So um, if you are creating a list, you may create a list that's much more for you, you know, the miracles in your life, the specific things that have happened for you. Uh, God's generosity is just, uh, we could spend a long, long time looking at it. Romans 5 says this, God proves God's love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a really helpful verse to memorize because it, Jesus, what Jesus did for us wasn't because we were so cool or so great. You do not have to look a certain way or be a certain way to get God's favor. You have God's favor. God loves you. Jesus died for you even though, whether you know it or not, your life might be a bit of a mess. Some people are more aware than others and sometimes uh, it's more obvious uh, than others. Last week during the service we had a beautiful Christmas tree fully lit and towards the end of the service half of the lights went out. And uh, by the end of the service all those beautiful lights under the cross almost all of them were out. And uh, that happens more often than I like around here. But it also is really a tremendous model or reminder that's a lot what the manger was like. Mary and Joseph weren't hoping that their baby would be born during tax season. But Jesus was born during tax season. And the way that particular tax worked that year, nobody likes paying, does anybody like paying taxes? I mean, you might, you might be proud of where your money's going or maybe you're not pay, paying, so, yep, yeah, uh, does anybody not like paying taxes? There's a few more hands there. All right, so this was a taxing system where that particular year, in order to pay the government, which is not, uh, we've just seen for a good portion of the room is not what their happiest experience. In order to pay the government, you had to go to the city of your birth. So can I see the hands of people where that'd be San Diego? You wouldn't have to go very far. We've got like 5% or 10%. So the rest of us would be traveling hundreds, dozens, hundreds, or thousands of miles to get to pay our taxes. That was the state for Mary and Joseph. Mary was nine months pregnant. Nine months pregnant, they didn't have planes. She got to walk or go on a donkey to pay taxes. And when she got there, the city that she was, her ancestors were from was a cow town, M not a real cow town, meaning it was a little tiny burg, a small place. Not Ramona. Ramona's way too big. I, I don't know what's small enough. 
There's no city in China that's small enough to give. It's just a little, sorry King David, but it's a little dump, a little tiny place. But King David had lots of kids and kids' kids and, and so all of King David's descendants had to go to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. And there were so many that there was not enough room in any of the hotels. So Mary and Joseph arrived and even the Motel 6 was sold out. Probably started with aspirations. Perhaps the Hilton? No? All right. And just going down the chains, even the Red Roof? No. Okay, the Motel 6. And at the Motel 6, the guy says, no, but I've got room in the garage. So imagine for the guys, imagine you're 20, your bride's about to have her baby, and what you can provide when you're going to pay taxes is actually a garage isn't the right way to phrase it because they didn't have cars, they had cows and sheep and horses. Um, has anybody smelled a barn so you know what a, an old time garage used to smell like? Um, what do you suppose Mary felt nine months pregnant to be breathing in cow poop? Oh, this is just what I pictured it. This is what I've been dreaming of. No, that was probably not what she had been dreaming of. Any more than from time to time we dream of the lights going out on the Christmas tree or the lights going out under the cross or perhaps some disaster in your life that may have happened this week or 20 years ago and you're still not over it. God is with us in the mess. God loves us in the mess. There's a favorite part of my tree over there. And it's not exactly a mess, but it is a favorite part of my tree. Um, so I took a picture of it this morning. There's one branch, part of the branch that's this, uh, it's about six inches long. And it has, I can see from here, one, two, three, four, five, six ornaments on it. Because when we decorated the Christmas tree, we had adults and kids. And the kids three and under could reach that one branch. And, and that one little spot has <laughs> sort of bowed over a little bit because it's got so many ornaments on it. That's the kind of thing that God loves, is things that the interior decorator would say, oh, no, 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 no. But God loves the age-appropriate things that are going on in your life. And the things that are going on in your life that aren't what you were expecting, not what you were counting on, not what you were hoping for. Philippians 2 says this, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, this is talking about his time before earth, he was in heaven already, in the form of God. He did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. This is not typical for kings on earth, right? If you think about human history and, and all the kings and pharaohs and rulers, a great percentage of them lived in terrific wealth compared to the people who lived many cases in poverty. That's not what God's kingdom is like. In God's kingdom, it's kind of upside down. That God is so generous that God keeps giving so that we might be enriched. The king keeps giving so that the people might have abundance. Jesus did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness. And found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So at the time Jesus is born, 
this full story that we've been talking about is not known. It won't develop for another 30 years. There are times when Abraham and Sarah here, you're going to have as many descendants as there are stars up there and they look up there and that's a lot, but they've still got no kids for the next 10 years. The promise is true. It's going to come to place. But even 10 years after that, there's only going to be one baby, Isaac. There are times when we're just in a season of waiting. When we were lighting the Advent candles, first one, God announces things far in advance and then sometimes we wait. And in some cases, wait and wait and wait. Some of God's promises are beyond your lifetime. Some of God's promises are beyond the lifetime of your great, great, great grandkids. 2 Corinthians 8. You know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This is the kind of generosity that God has for us. We're going to take a moment for prayer. God, thank you that you are so generous that um, it's kind of overwhelming. It's hard sometimes for us to even begin to count. We look at the stars in the sky and we think that's not many because there's light pollution and clouds. And then you blow away the clouds and in the darkness of a power outage or the darkness of the desert, we begin to see what actually is up there for us. And we see quickly that we can't count all the blessings that you have, that we can't number them or imagine them. We thank you and we praise you for all your many mercies to us. Amen. I'm going to add a PS right now because uh, it's because uh, I w I think it'd be helpful. I used to live down uh, on uh, Wind and Sea Beach. Uh, when I lived down there, there were seven homes in a row that were constructed that all looked the same. They're all tall and skinny, three stories. I thought they looked ridiculous. But my parents liked to seek houses. So when they came over, they said, oh, let's go look at them. And so we went on an open house and toured them. And to my surprise, inside, they work really, really well. It's well designed. As skinny as they are, they use the space well so that it's not all um, ladders and hallways. It, in fact, works. So after seeing that, I wanted one. They were selling for just under a million dollars at the time. I didn't have just under a million, or just under a hundred thousand for that matter. But I really wanted one. God gives good things. God says you can ask, you can receive. Why well, I wanted one because you could look out right onto the ocean, and it would be such a great place to be painting. It would just be awesome that the garages that they had there, you just open up the door and you're right there, could paint with the natural light. It was awesome. One of the things that I've learned over time is that it's very helpful when I think about what do I want, to also think about what do I really want. So let me use an example that's not from my life, but might be from, but is from someone else's. Some women think they want a pair of shoes. But it's not really what they want. What they want might be to feel better about themselves or to have the respect of their friends or to feel loved. Or uh, it could be a lot of different things, but it's really not the shoes that what they want. They think that when they get the shoes, they'll get what they really want. And in the case of that, those homes, I really didn't 
one, one of those homes, and I, or plus it was way beyond possibility for me. But as I prayed about it, two months later, uh, the landlord came to me and said, uh, Mark, we've got one of the garages just opened up. It'd be this much money, would you like it? And I went down to look at the garage. You open up the garage door, it has the same view as those houses. So yes, I would like this very much. It was the best painting studio I'd had. And uh, it's just a great, great space for a very small amount of money. I thought that I knew what I wanted. I mean, I, I knew it was outrageous, but, I, but what I really wanted was a place to paint with that light, and that's what God gave me. There are times when you think you might be asking for something, and God gives you something unexpected that's not quite what you really wanted under that tree. You really had hoped for a slightly different present. If you begin praising God and thanking God and rejoicing in what you have, I'm pretty sure you'll discover it in fact was exactly right. Maybe not what you were thinking would be exactly right, but it's exactly right.